$200 order, a ton on this order, fertilizer. Senator Heffernan, the, I... the, the debate is interrupted. Uh, you will be in continuation. It being 2 p.m., we uh, go to questions without notice. Senator Cormann. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister uh, representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Uh, I refer the Minister to Budget Paper No. 1, uh, which shows that the government will raise about $18 billion in carbon tax revenue uh, over the first three years of the world's biggest carbon tax. Uh, why will Australia's 23 million people uh, pay an average of $115 million per week over the next three years? Uh, when the 502 million people in the 30-nation European Union ETS uh, will pay only $23 million per week. Is the Minister aware that the Government is imposing a carbon tax burden on Australians which is five times higher than that in the 30-nation European ETS, a regional grouping whose collective GDP is 14 times the size of ours here in Australia? Why is the Government so intent to push up the cost of living and the cost of doing business in Australia by more than any other government in any other country in the world. Order. 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 The Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President, and I congratulate the Senator for yet again managing to get the Tactics Committee to give him the head start. And it doesn't appear to be very democratic over there, but he certainly does very well uh, in terms of getting a number of questions. But of course, the question that was put to me is not really a question, it's a, another rant which includes a whole range of assertions, some of which may not be correct, some of which may not be correct, uh, and, and really no question at the end of it because the, the senator and the opposition are not interested in actually asking a question. They're simply interested in bringing into this place the same sort of dishonest scare campaign that we saw for months and months and months in the lead up uh, to the 1st of July uh, and which we are still seeing, although I note, I note uh, that uh, Mr Rabbit is starting to backtrack ever so slightly, ever so slightly in his comments today on electricity prices uh, from the previous position where he denounced, he denounced uh, the Prime Minister's proposition uh, that there were other things at play in electricity prices as an absolute furphy. So we're seeing even Mr Rabbit starting to shift back uh, when it comes to the scare campaign because he knows, he knows, he knows that it is no longer tenable to be telling people that the carbon price will shut down whole industries, whole industries will be shut down. He knows it is no longer tenable to be telling people that Wyala will be wiped off the face of the map. Matt, this is, this is, this is the, the harsh reality uh, that those opposite, that those opposite are, 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 are dealing with. As the senator knows, uh, we have put in place a comprehensive package, a package which also addresses international competitiveness through the provision of free permits, something which is not addressed in the coalition's policy, which would simply, simply impose a tax on all Australian households of $1,300 per year. The highest carbon price on offer, Mr President, is that proposed by those opposite. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, is the minister also aware that the Gillard government's carbon tax burden imposed on Australians is nearly 20 times larger than the regional greenhouse gas initiative scheme in the United States, which covers 10 American states with a population more than double the size of ours? Why is the Gillard government so intent to push up the cost of living and the cost of doing business in Australia by so much more than in the US? The the Minister. Well, the first point I'd make in terms of cost of living is that the CPI impact is substantially less than the GST when it was introduced. So if those opposite are concerned about the cost of living, they can explain why a 2.5 per cent increase to the CPI was OK, but a 0.7 per cent increase uh, to the CPI with associated tax cuts and increases to the pension and family tax benefit is somehow not OK. Uh, I mean, it's, it's it beggars belief. In terms of the costs, I would make this point that the Climate Institute expect Britain to have a carbon price of $24 to $30 a tonne. This is over the next few years. Sweden, $130 a tonne. Switzerland, $30 to $60. Norway, $53. And Ireland, $24 to $37 a tonne. 
self-evidently not what Senator Cormann is suggesting, quite opposite to what Senator Cormann is suggesting. And again, I mention this. Senator Cormann always fails to consider the impact of free permits, which reduce, for the most emissions intended, trade-exposed industries, reduce the carbon impact to about $1.30 a tonne. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. The Minister, of course, is well aware that Europe also has free permits, and of course she always forgets to mention that. Why is the Gillard government introducing the world's biggest carbon tax, uh, which will do nothing to reduce global emissions, when no other nation is imposing a similar burden on its export and import competing industries and households? Because that is exactly what you're doing. You are imposing an economy-wide uh, carbon tax, which is the biggest in the world. The Order, order, order. The Minister. This is the same tired old speech that we've heard ad nauseum from those opposite, the same tired old speech that we hear over and over again. And what I would say is why, why are you so intent on rolling back the tax cuts and increasing the tax to income tax rates for every Australian under $80,000? <coughs> why do you hate small business so much that you want to take their tax breaks off them? Why do you want to take their tax breaks off them? Why is it? That you, why, why are you telling Australian pensioners that you're somehow going to remove uh, the increase uh, to the pension that this government has put in place? And why are you imposing? Why are you seeking to impose the largest carbon tax? The largest carbon tax. Uh, why are you seeking to impose $1,300 per every Australian household in additional tax to achieve the same environmental outcome? More cost to the economy, more cost to households, more cost to business. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Education for Schools, uh, and Senator Carr. Given the latest inexplicable delay in the government's response to the Gonski review of schools, will the government give an unequivocal guarantee that legislation for a more equitable funding model will be presented to the parliament in time for passage through both houses before Christmas? Minister representing the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth, Senator Kim Carr. Uh, Mr. President, I thank uh, Senator Moon for her question. The Minister, the Minister for Schools has indicated on a number of occasions that it's his intention to have legislation ready for consideration by the Parliament before the end of this year. Uh, the government is determined to pursue the reforms as outlined through the Godski Review. Uh, we are committed to ensure that every child has a access to a world-class education so that each student can reach his or her potential. And that's why the government has doubled the funding for Australian schools compared to that under the Howard government. That's why this government has modernised facilities in every school. That's why this government is investing in better teacher training. And of course, that's why this government has provided information about uh, children uh, or ch children's education through the My School website. Uh, this is, of course, a very strong record of performance by the government. And we are determined to ensure that the Parliament has the opportunity to consider this legislation, and we will announce our final response to review very shortly. And of course, until that time, it's too early to talk about the, the various uh, funding arrangements that are to be made with the states. Uh, but we have made a commitment from the outset to deliver on this review, and we'll continue to work with the states and territories and the non-government sectors to improve. All Australian schools. Senator Mill. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the Minister for his answer, but with respect, every intention is not the same as an unequivocal guarantee. And given the latest inexplicable delay, no understanding of why, will the Minister now give us a guarantee we'll get the legislation by the end of the year? And secondly, will the Minister say how the government intends to fund in full the implementation of the Gonski review? Order. The Minister. The Minister for Schools has indicated that he will have the legislation ready for consideration by the Parliament before the end of the year. The, has, he has indicated that he is working with the states and territories as to the funding arrangements that underpin 
that review, and he has indicated that our final response, that is the government's final response to the review, will be delivered shortly. And of course, under, in those circumstances, it is too early to be able to determine what the funding formulas will be or funding arrangements will be until such time as those conversations are had with the states and territories. Of course, the government is determined that we can improve our education system right across this country, and the government is determined to ensure that the states work with the Commonwealth to see that that happens. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for that answer. But of course, the states say they have no money in this context, and so will the minister say how the federal government is going to raise the additional five billion that is needed, and will the government consider redirecting? the $3.4 billion subsidy it's providing to facilitate new coal railways in the Hunter Valley and redirect that to school funding. The minister. What, uh, if I might uh, repeat, uh, Senator, the uh, government's intention is to talk to the states and territories about the funding arrangements to support the Gonski reforms. We do have great schools in this country. We want to see better schools in this country. We are determined to ensure that our education system continues to contribute to Australia having a strong economy, and we want to ensure that everybody in this country gets a fair go through that education system. And it's too important and too early for anyone to be ruling out what processes will be followed in regard to their conversations with the states about the way in which we will improve the school system in this country. And we'll be releasing more details in the coming weeks and we'll be discussing those details with the states and territories and the non-government education authorities. And we expect that there will be a genuine interest from all the parties to education in this country about developing a better education outcomes for all Australians. And I'm sure Time has that expired. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Can the minister inform the Senate what the government is doing to protect Australia's strong biosecurity status and agricultural productivity? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank uh, Senator Moore for her continuing interest in biosecurity. Australia's agricultural sector, the farm gate, contributes up to $50 uh, billion to our national economy. Australia's farmers not only provide us with uh, primary production, uh, which underpins more than 300,000 jobs in rural uh, Australia. Uh, this industry is worth protecting uh, in a biosecurity environment. Uh, that's why the Gillard government is committed to having a strong biosecurity framework, a biosecurity framework where decisions are made to protect Australia's biosecurity based on the best available science. Labor has worked since 2008 to improve an old biosecurity system that we inherited from uh, those opposite. It was the Labor government that ordered a review of biosecurity in Australia, and in December 2008, the Bill Review One Biosecurity, a working partnership, was released. The government agreed in principle to all of those 84 recommendations. Uh, since Beale, uh, we invested more than $1.6 billion to safeguard Australia's biosecurity status, protect Australian farmers and the environment, and underpin Australia's reputation as a reliable exporter for high-quality food and fibre. The 2012-13 budget delivered well over half a billion dollars to maintain Australia's biosecurity system and improve the recommendations uh, by Beale. The budget included almost $400 million over seven years to deliver a state-of-the-art post-entry quarantine facility, reversing the short-sighted the short decision made by Mr Warren Truss when he was in Cabinet to flog off Australia's five existing PEQ facilities, only, only to lease them back uh, with no regard for changing land use, no maintenance plan and no plan for the future. Uh, we've already put forward $20 million over three years for biosecurity Time's information. Expired. Senator Ludwig. Senator Moore. Senator Moore. Thank you, Minister. Can the Minister advise whether the cuts of the Queensland Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries made by the Newman government will impact on biosecurity? The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Moore. Uh, I've read with great concern in the uh, Brisbane Times article, which reported that up to 550 of Queensland Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry positions 
could be axed. That amounts to about one-fifth of the capacity of the department. While the Newman government, of course, has pledged to support frontline services, Premier Newman has changed the decade-old definition of frontline with a purpose to only cut jobs. And I've been so concerned about the risk that Premier Newman government proposed cuts would make to Australia's biosecurity status that over two weeks ago I wrote to my counterpart, Minister McVeigh, in Queensland because biosecurity remains an important issue. It isn't one to play politics with. Have I heard from Minister McVeigh about this issue? Have I heard a response from him? No, not one word. The Newman government is no longer funding biosecurity Time's research. Expired, it Senator Ludwig. Would... Time has expired. Time's expired. Now, when there's silence, we'll proceed. When there's silence, we'll proceed. Senator Moore. Can the minister also advise what joint programs in agriculture would be undermined without adequate support from the Queensland Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry? The minister. Uh, thank you. Because what we what we have from those opposite, in fact, uh, uh, Senator Macdonald should be embarrassed because the Newman government has failed to, to support James Cook University funding for biosecurity, but not one word out of. Not one word out of them about that issue. What we hear is silence from the coalition when their when their when their friends in when their friends over in uh, in the state government in Queensland start cutting biosecurity. We don't hear a word from you about that. And as I said in my previous answer on the 3rd of August, I wrote to the responsible minister, as I said, to seek an assurance that Queensland remain committed to protecting biosecurity in Queensland, Australia. And Minister McVeigh has failed to respond to the Australian government on Queensland's ability to fulfil its obligations, because there are a range of areas. There are issues around fire ants that we haven't heard from. But his failure to respond is really consistent with the coalition's record Time of neglect of Australia's biosecurity system. Time has expired. Senator, Senator thank, Order. Thank, Order. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Wong. I refer the minister to a survey reported in today's media which finds that 66 per cent of small businesses are absorbing the impact of the government's carbon tax rather than passing the impost on to consumers. Will the minister now concede that the carbon tax is having an adverse economic impact on small business? Does the minister agree with the statements such as that by small business owner Doug Cush, the owner of Balata Gold Pasta, that the carbon tax will force some small businesses to the wall? Order. 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 On my right. Order. The minister representing the treasurer, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, first, uh, I think it's important to get some facts on the table in relation to small business and the carbon price. Uh, the truth is, there is no small business which is directly liable uh, for the carbon price. Uh, the truth also is that the electricity cost of a small retail business is estimated uh, to make up less than 2 per cent of total costs. And on the basis of Treasury modelling, therefore, the cost increase of the carbon price would therefore be only 0.2 per cent of overall expenditure of a typical small business. Uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, the government has also uh, made uh, provision in the previous budget for assistance to small business and also in the clean energy package. Uh, we have increased the small business instant asset write-off from 1,000 to 6,500. This is a significant tax break for small business uh, when they buy equipment for their businesses. It is disappointing that the party of small business, those opposite, uh, want to take that tax break back. Want to take back that tax break, and if those on the, on the, on the opposition benches aren't aware of that promise, that was a promise uh, that Mr. Rob made. That you are in in the cart, Mr. Rob, my counterpart. You're in the cart for making sure you take back the tax cut. Uh, that this government is providing uh, to small business. In addition, uh, you would be aware uh, that uh, the government has included a new loss carryback scheme in the previous budget. We estimate about 90 per cent of the beneficiaries of that uh, to be small business. 
Mr. Mr. President, I think it's important in this debate to recognise uh, there is a cost impact on small businesses as a result of electricity uh, price impacts. Uh, but re let's recall, let's recall, let's recall that the largest component of electricity price increases uh, in in this country have not been as a result of carbon. Is not as a result of carbon, and I know Time that's not something expired. Senator Abetz Time wants to expired. hear. Senator, Senator Dennis. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Given uh, the global economy is still suffering the effects of the global financial crisis and the current European debt crisis, does the minister concede that imposing heavy new burdens on small business like the carbon tax for very small environmental gain in time of such global uncertainty is poor public policy? Senator Conroy. Order. Order. Minister. Order. Uh, thank thank wait, you, Mr. Just wait a minute, Senator Wong. Order. Order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. What is poor public policy? Is a command and control, taxpayer-funded, bureaucratically run scheme such as the one that Senator Cedar Sinodinus has regrettably had to sign up for. I mean, Senator Sinodinus uh, has, a, has a sound public policy background. I might not always agree with him, but at least he understands the issues, and he, in his heart of hearts, would know how ridiculous it is uh, that those opposite have moved away from a price on carbon, a price throughout the economy, and have gone uh, for a taxpayer-funded, command and control, bureaucratically run carbon scheme with a higher cost to the economy and a higher cost to small business. Uh, the, 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 biggest, uh, the biggest impost uh, that could be put on the Australian economy from a carbon policy is the carbon policy of those opposite. That is the reality. And in addition, they are seeking to roll back the tax breaks that this government is wanting to give and is giving uh, Australia's small business. Senator, Senator Dennis. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr President. Supplementary question two. Will the minister release the modelling that underpins the answer she just gave in relation to small business, including the pass-through factors that have been assumed about the capacity of small business to pass on price increases? Order. 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 The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. The, the modelling to which I was referring in terms of the uh, estimated increase in the carbon price is the Treasury modelling, which has been publicly released, as the Senator well knows. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think uh, there's anything further there I can, I can add to it. Uh, I, would, uh, I would also uh, say to him, uh, in response to his previous uh, question, I am pleased that he does acknowledge there was a global financial crisis. That appears to be something that uh, Mr Hockey and Mr Robb have forgotten about. But, uh, Senator Senator Sinodinus has, has enough uh, uh, intellectual self-respect uh, to not follow the talking points when it comes uh, to uh, airbrushing the, glo the global financial crisis out of any economic discussion. But back to the issue uh, in terms of a carbon price. Uh, we put in place assistance measures. We put in place uh, some uh, tax breaks for small business. Uh, the reality is, and the Senate, the Senator would know this, the highest cost of a business uh, of a carbon policy is the one that his leader is advocating. Senator De Natale. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is for the Minister for Finance and Deregulation, Senator Wong. Uh, Minister, I draw your attention to the victory the Commonwealth won in the High Court last week against tobacco companies in defence of the plain packaging legislation passed by this parliament in November last year. Given that the Commonwealth has over $200 million invested in companies such as British American Tobacco, Philip Morris and Imperial Tobacco through the Future Fund, do you agree with the Minister for Health, who said over the weekend, and I quote, I would prefer the Future Fund did not have tobacco shares? The Minister for Finance and Deregulation, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and uh, I thank the Senator the uh, for uh, the question. And yes, it was a significant victory uh, for the government, uh, uh, and I congratulate uh, the Attorney General and the former Minister for Health, as well as the Health Minister, for for taking uh, this matter forward and for Australia being a world leader uh, on this issue. Uh, the, uh, in relation to the broader issue, which is the issue of uh, the investments of the Future Fund. Uh, as the Senator would know, because he and I have had uh, a lengthy discussion uh, in the context of uh, uh, estimates 
Uh, we, we, as the government, do not believe it's appropriate for governments be, to be hands-on directing investments in the future fund. Uh, uh, the, the reason for that is, uh, as uh, was the case both under the previous <coughs> government and this government, uh, the future fund should exercise its discretion regarding investment independently of the government and independently of the wishes of particular, of particular um, ministers or senators or, or, or MPs. Um, if, if, if that were not the case, Senator, you'd get, you could get to a, a rather odd position where, for example, uh, you, might not, you might have a politician, for example, Senator Boswell, saying they shouldn't invest in renewable energy because he doesn't believe in climate change or a range of other matters that you can think of. So whatever one's personal views in this, in this debate, and uh, uh, you know, there are politicians, and including uh, on this side, who have expressed their personal views about where those investments ought to be. Uh, I think it is a different thing to then make a decision uh, as you are advocating for through your legislation and I think uh, by the tone of your question to suggest that um, uh, ministers and members of parliament should be directly directing investment decisions by the future fund. I, I don't think that is a, a sensible way to approach uh, uh, the management of that fund. Senator De Natale. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have a supplementary question. It's reported today that the ACT government will be the first government in Australia to stop investing in tobacco companies through its superannuation investments. Does the minister believe that this decision somehow compromises the independence of any future investment decisions in the ACT? And if so, how does it compromise this independence? Well, the minister can only answer that in so much as it relates to the portfolio. Um, the, I call the minister. Well, Mr. President, that, that's a matter for the ACT government, not a matter for me, and, and that should be a matter addressed to the ACT treasurer. Uh, what I can say to you, consistent with what I previously said, whatever one's personal views about investments, uh, I do, and the government does, have a concern with a proposition that says uh, the personal views of a politician should be the ones guiding investment decisions in the future fund. As I said, you know, Senator Boswell, renewable energy. Senator Betts might say something about trade unions, uh, and uh, uh, and Senator Joyce might say something about companies which have uh, 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 you know foreign investment and agricultural land. Now, none of those things, none of those things, would be an appropriate way. I'm so talking in the hypothetical, Barnaby. I mean, don't, you don't need order. to be sensitive. Order. Um, <laughs> order. Order. Senator Wong, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, our point, my, the point is, Senator, what is the right legal framework? The appropriate framework is for these decisions, including the decisions about ESG principles, ought to be made by the Future Fund Board. Time's expired. Senator De Natale. I thank the minister for her answer, and I note that the same defence, the thin end of the wedge argument, was used by the tobacco companies in defence of plain packaging legislation. But I'll go on. Uh, does the minister agree with the managing director of the Future Fund, Mark Burgess, that an investment in tobacco is a, quote, sustainable investment? And if so, how can an investment in an industry that kills one in every two of its customers be called sustainable? The minister. Mr President, well, I'm going to take issue with the little aside which preceded the question and the suggestion that somehow this government is akin to big tobacco in the argument we use, we've used. I mean, this government has led the world, has led the world when it comes to taking on big tobacco. And for once, the Greens could actually acknowledge that. Instead of trying to pay politics, for once you could actually acknowledge that. Uh, because that is the position that the government has taken across the board. That has been the approach that the health minister has taken and has gone and been fought all the way to the High Court. And we're very pleased with the decision that was handed down and the position that this government has taken, which is to be a world leader when it comes to taking on this important public health issue. Senator Crossan. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to uh, Senator Kim Carr, uh, representing the Minister for School Education. Uh, and I ask, can the minister inform the Senate of the government's priorities in planning for school improvements and in school funding reform? Minister representing the Minister for School Education, Senator Carr. I thank uh, Senator Crossan for her question and acknowledge her long-standing interests in education. And of course, education is this government's number one priority, 
And that's why we have doubled the investment for schools since we came to office. The Commonwealth now invests some $13.9 billion per annum. And it is our priority because we know education is the great enabler. We know that it provides us with the opportunity to ensure that, the, that this whole country, this, that our people right across this country, have the skills for the 21st century. Education is the foundation stone of our innovation system. It brings wealth to our industries. It helps us build jobs, high skill, high wage jobs for our people. It lays the foundations for this nation's prosperity. And it unlocks, it unlocks the doors of inequality in this country. And so a fair go, a fair go in education is a fundamental for ensuring that we have a just society. And we ask the question over here, what about your position? What about your position? Your position is to actually attack education spending, take money away from trade training, take money away from schools, take money away from universities. That has been the position of those opposite. That is your stated priority, not to accept the Gongsi reforms, not to accept the need for increase in Commonwealth investment in education. That is the position of those opposite. Lord Brandis, you know the truth. You know the truth. You are not committed to support education in this country, and you have made it very clear that in your search for $70 billion, education will be your number one priority. It will be your quest to smash the education system in this country and to ensure that schools aren't able to provide the building blocks for a fair and just society. And of course, Time's approach... expired, Senator Kim Carr. Order. Senator Crossan. Well, thanks, uh, Mr. President. Just, uh, just building on that. Order. Order. For, uh... Order. Send across. Uh, thank you. I'll just wait for the Lord Highness to, to uh, finish, and I'll ask my question. Order. Um, I further ask then, uh, what commitments will this government make? The minister. Uh, I haven't finished my I, question because I was so rudely interrupted from yeah, people I, on I the other side, you were Mr. President. Finished. All right. Thank you. Continue. So I do ask what commitments will the government make for parents in the reforms for school funding regime and the implications for school fees? Order. The Minister. Well, Mr President, uh, Mr Garrett and the Prime Minister have made it very, very clear many, on many occasions now that no school will lose money under Labor's plan. Funding for every school whether it be government, whether it be independent, whether it be Catholic, will continue to rise. Now, Senator Brandis asked the question about cutting school funding. What he ought, of course, tell the Senate is that he ought to tell the Senate that the Liberal policy is to cut $2.8 billion from school funding. He ought to tell the Senate that they have a policy about of taking money away from schools to fill their $70 billion black hole. Now, only a Luddite, only a Luddite would pursue a policy that would attack education. O only people who are very primitive in their attitudes would take the view that you find savings of that dimension in the school education system. Our plan is to ensure that every child has the right to public support Time for their order. education. Order. Time has expired. Order. Now, when, when there's silence on both sides, order. I'm waiting to call Senator Crossan on my right. I'm waiting to call Senator Crossan. Senator Crossan. Mr. President, I further ask, uh, can the minister outline the responsibilities of state and territory governments? in this national agenda of reform for schools. The Minister. Well, thank you, Senator Crossan. Look, in coming weeks, the government will enter discussions with the states and territories on the details of the new education plan. We will approach these discussions in good faith, and we will expect that all premiers, all chief ministers, will do the same. And of course, in that context, as I've already indicated, it's not of course, in a position for anyone to be able to rule out what options are available in regard to the funding of, these, of the new school plan. But I would remind the premiers and chief ministers that the coalition policy is to remove $2.8 billion, 
$2.8 billion from the school system. Now, these are cuts they've already announced, and that's because this is not just the $70 billion that they've already made. And we ask this simple question, where will that money come from? And of course, we will see straight from the we we'll see working people will have directly affected. Time has expired, sent order. Order. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. I refer the Minister to the additional costs imposed on Mr. Cole Costs, a turkey farmer in Tamworth, who will pay $582 per month more for electricity as a direct result of the government's carbon tax, and could pay up to $7,000 more over the course of a year. This comes as Ibis World recently estimated that farmers will be hit with a massive $3.2 billion increase in annual costs as a result of the carbon tax. Given the carbon tax has now been in operation for a little over a month and a half, can the minister advise the Senate by how much does the government expect the global temperatures to reduce by due to the extra cost being paid by Mr Cost and all of the Australian farmers? Order. Minister representing the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President, and I, I trust that the Senator has recovered from the vicious attack on him by Mr. Costello recently. Um, uh, but, Mr. President, in relation to the last part of his question, in relation to the last part of his question, the answer is by the same amount as your policy, but at lower cost to the economy. By the same amount as your policy, but at lower cost to the economy, including to farmers and to households. Uh, and that might be something he might want to be aware of uh, within the coalition party room, that he's actually signing up to a policy that has the same environmental outcome but at higher costs, with tax cuts for the 80, everyone earning $80,000 a year being, being taken back by, uh, by the coalition. That's the policy he signed up for, and I suspect there'd be a few constituents uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in his neck of the woods who'd be interested in that. In terms of the Tamworth turkey farmer, the advice I have uh, from uh, uh, the minister is that uh, uh, that uh, farmer quoted in the newspapers today had a carbon, pri carbon price impact of around 6.5 per cent on his electricity bill. Uh, this is in fact under electricity uh, under treasury uh, under that anticipated by treasury modelling. On that farmer's electricity bill, the New South Wales government's increase in network charges accounted for around double the carbon price. So I would hope. Uh, that the senator would take up his argument uh, with the New South Wales government, uh, with double the intensity with which he is taking up the argument in this chamber, uh, given that the majority of the increase uh, that I'm advised is in fact flows uh, from state government component increases, that is network uh, increase charges. Uh, and of course, uh, the, that same uh, person, uh, depending on their income, may well be eligible uh, for the government's uh, tax cuts uh, and the small business tax cuts that I uh, referred to in response to the question from Senator Sinodinos. Senator Williams. A supplementary question, Mr. President. Given a carbon tax will also increase the costs of fertilizer, feed, plastic bags and boxes. It is very difficult to, difficult to estimate by how much the carbon tax will increase these prices. By how much does the government expect the carbon tax to increase the annual costs of an Australian turkey farmer? The, the minister. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, I've answered the question in relation to the carbon price impact for the relevant turkey farmer of, uh, on his electricity bill. Uh, I would also, if the senator is interested in, in the agricultural sector, just remind him that the government uh, has put in place the Carbon Farming Initiative. That, that is a $1.7 billion land sector package to reinvest carbon price revenue in our land sector, including through the Biodiversity Fund and the Carbon Farming Futures package. I'd also note that uh, the Treasury modelling uh, shows that with, with agricultural emissions excluded from the carbon price, gross output 
Gross output in the agricultural sector is projected to be higher the, with a carbon price than without, and the sector is projected to grow uh, by over 130 per cent uh, by 2050. And that modelling, of course, does not include uh, the, the programs for assistance uh, to the sector in the Clean Energy Future Package. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a further supplementary question. Given Australia's farming sector is already working in a difficult environment with rising costs, a high Australian dollar and red tape. Can the minister explain why the government is so insistent on making life tougher for Australian farmers by imposing the world's biggest and most expensive carbon tax for no environmental gain? All order, 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 order. On my right, the minister. Well. With respect to the senator, he's really going through the motions there, I think. I mean, it's the same question I've been asked time and time again. We've responded. I've responded. The government's responded. And the reality is uh, the, 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 the intensity of the scare campaign that Senator Williams, Senator Joyce, uh, Mr Abbott and so many of those, so many of those, so many of those opposite uh, ha has frankly fading with the reality that uh, uh, the carbon price impact is uh, pretty much around where Treasury and the government said it would be, uh, and uh, that is the reality. Uh, if the senator is concerned about regional Australia, I would hope that he would recognise that this government is in fact, in, in fact investing more than regional in regional Australia than any other previous Australian government. Any other previous Australian government. 1.8 billion over six years for the health and hospital fund, two regional priority rounds, 500 million regional pri priority round of education investment. Fun and so many others. Time has you could expired. Never get. Time's never expired, get. Senator Wong. Time's expired. Order. Order. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Industry and Innovation, Senator Lundy. Can the Minister inform the Senate what the report of the Prime Minister's Manufacturing Task Force, released last Thursday, recommends to government? Minister representing the um, Minister for Innovation and Industry, Senator Lundy. Thank you, Mr. President. The non government members of the Prime Minister's Manufacturing Task Force, representing business, unions, and the research sector, have produced a comprehensive report titled Smarter Manufacturing for a Smarter Australia. The report makes a strong case for the vital role that manufacturing plays in our economy, both now and in the long term. To quote from the report, the non-government task force leaders believe that Australia's future will be brighter with a broad-based national economy, built on more than a few industries in more than a few regions. A broad-based national economy is one that is stronger, more resilient, more innovative and ultimately more able to provide for the needs of Australia and Australians. It is how we can break the cycle after the lost decade in which apparently uh, in which apparent prosperity has boomed, while underlying productivity growth has stalled and competitiveness gone backwards. End quote. Mr. President, the report acknowledges that the manufacturing sector currently faces challenges, such as the high Australian dollar and more intensive global and regional competition. However, the task force makes it clear that manufacturing can prosper and grow by taking advantage of the significant emerging opportunities, especially in the Asian region. Mr. President, the task force report builds on the government's current policy settings with a strong set of proposals to ensure manufacturing is a dynamic contributor to Australia's prosperity and an important part of a diverse economy that creates skilled jobs. Thank you, Mr. President. My first supplementary. Can the minister outline the government's reaction to the report of the Prime Minister's Manufacturing Task Force? Minister. Thank you, and I thank Senator Urquhart for her question. The Gillard government is committed to ensuring that Australia retains a strong manufacturing industry and welcomes this report. We will now carefully consider the task force's findings and respond in detail with a major industry and innovation statement in the coming months. This will be our vision for the future of manufacturing and will set out our plans for supporting manufacturing to remain and improve its international competitiveness. 
The government is supportive in principle of most of the report's recommendations, and specifically the government accepts the task force's recommendation to establish a manufacturing leaders group. We see an important role for this group in assisting the government to implement its response to the task force's recommendations. Order, Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My second supplementary. Can the minister advise the Senate what the government is doing to address the issues raised by the task force? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. It would be my pleasure. In addition to the leaders' group, the government will immediately bring together the industry capability network, the Buy Australian at Home and Abroad Supply Advocates, Oz Industry, and Enterprise Connect to share information on opportunities for Australian manufacturers in large domestic investment projects, with a particular focus on the resources sector. The task force report builds on the government's current policy settings. And the government has been implementing a range of reforms consistent with the direction of the report, including lifting Australian industry participation in major resources projects, encouraging innovation in manufacturing by introducing order, a new R&D tax Senator Lundy, incentive. Senator Lundy, you are entitled to be heard in silence. Order. 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 Senators Conroy and Joyce. Senator Lundy, continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Those opposite don't like hearing what the government is doing because it's, there's so much. Reducing the energy costs of manufacturers and stimulating innovation through the 1.2 billion clean technology programs encouraging investment in clean technology through the $10 billion Clean Energy Finance Corporation, co-investing in the oil important automotive expired. industry. Time's expired. Order. Time's expired. Senator Mason. Um, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to Senator Kim Carr, yes. the minister representing the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth. Given that the or, Cairns or, School order. of Distance— Senator Mason, you're entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Order. Senator Mason, is it? Order. Senator Mason is entitled to be heard in silence. Order. Senator Mason. Mr. President, given that the Cairns School of Distance Education in my home state of Queensland. Will, according to modelling by state governments and non government schools, lose $4.4 million, or over half of its annual funding, and 3,253 other government and non government just, just schools wait, around Senator Australia. Senator Mason, just resume. Order. Order. I'm the minister is entitled to hear the question as I am. Senator Ferner. Se Senator Hefner. Order. Order. Senator Mason, continue. Your direction, Mr. President. Should I start again? No, no. continue, <laughs> Senator Mason. <laughs> well, Howard, given that the Cairns School of Distance Education in my home state of Queensland. Well, according to modelling by state governments and non-government schools, lose $4.4 million, or over its half its annual funding, and 3,253 other government and non-government schools around Australia are set to lose, on average, $500,000 in funding per year under the, under the government's new funding model. Can the minister make a firm and unequivocal commitment that no school will be worse off in real terms? In real terms under its funding reforms. The uh, minister representing the Minister for School Education, Early Childhood and Youth, Senator Kim Carr. Thank you. And I thank Senator Mason for his question. It's been a long time. I look forward to many more questions uh, from him. The, uh, well, well, I, order. I, I, order. 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 
Senator Carr, to the, to well, the question. Thank you. I will Carr. say that about Senator Mason, he does actually care about this stuff. He is actually interested. That's very unusual on the other side. Now, Senator, Senator, Senator Mason, though, I would urge you not to rely upon newspaper reports on uh, these figures because they are not the figures the government can confirm. They are not based on government proposals. They are assumptions that are made in the figures which do not bear any resemblance, any resemblance to the government's policy. And the schools should not in any way take seriously those reports because there is, there are not, this government is not about cutting funding. It is, I've indicated now, and this is the third opportunity I've had today to indicate this, that the government's view is that no school will lose money under our plan. In fact, school funding for every school, for government, for independent, for Catholic, will continue to rise under our plan for school improvement. Now, we've always said that no school will lose a dollar of funding per student, and that's what this government will deliver. The government has indicated, and the minister has confirmed today, the prime minister has confirmed today, that, we're, that no school will lose a dollar of funding per student, and that's what we will deliver. We are about ensuring that all Australians, that all Australians benefit from an improved education system, and as a consequence, this nation as a whole benefits from an improved education system. We want to ensure that the states and territories do their fair share as well, and we're in the business of discussing with them their funding commitments in the forthcoming period. We want to make sure that no school loses a dollar our funding, and we're outlining our plans in the next Time's few weeks expired. to deliver that. Send Senator Mason. President. Given that, according to modelling prepared by state governments and non-government schools, more than 3,000 schools, both public and private, stand to lose funding under the government's new funding model, how could the Prime Minister, as well as the Minister, claim with a straight face for months and months that no school will lose a dollar? Mr President, I asked the Minister this question before, but he didn't answer it. Will any school be worse off in real terms, the emphasis being real terms, under its funding reforms. The Minister. Uh, Mr President, I can now repeat, I think for the fifth time, that no school will lose money under our plans, that in fact funding for every school, government, independent and Catholic, will continue to rise under the pl our plan for school improvement, and that the, any figures that you're quoting uh, from the weekend's press are figures that are not those of the government. The assumption of mating those figures do not bear any resemblance to any to any government policy, and schools should in no order, way should no order. way take those S Senator Kim Carr, seriously. just resume your seat. Senator Mason has have asked a very ex I have asked a very specific question. So is this question. a point of order, I, Mr. President? I've asked a very specific question now twice. And that's where the funding will be cut. Is this a point of order? Yes, it is. Yes, well, as to relevance, uh, Mr. President, I have asked directly whether, in fact, there will be any cuts in real terms to school funding. And it's a specific and direct question. The minister, is the minister is answering the question, and I'll ask the minister to continue, and I'll listen to the minister's answer. The minister, continue. Uh, can I indicate to Senator Mason that the Order. statements that I have made repeatedly is that no school will lose money, and that's what the minister said, that's what the prime minister said. And, and, and in regard, in the regard to indexation, we have said that indexation will be a feature of the new school funding system. Senator Mason. Mr President, if, as the Prime Minister has repeatedly declared, that no school will lose a dollar under the new funding arrangements, why has the government delayed the release of its response to the Gonski review from this week to a number of weeks from now? What does the government have to hide and what do Australian schools have to fear? Now, when, there's, when there's silence, we will proceed. Order. Order. The Minister. What, uh, Mr President, we have secured new funding for important programs and we will continue this government's record and in fact record investments in schools and early childhood education. 
What we've been talking about is an expansion of, uh, of to $13.9 billion compared to the $8.5 billion in the last, uh, government, uh, or last to Howard uh, government budget. The opposition plans to cut plans to cut $2.8 billion from school education. $2.8 billion. Senator Mason, this leaves you terribly exposed. You should send those sorts of questions straight back to the Tactics Committee because they, in fact, bear no relationship to the fact that you are going to cut $2.8 billion. And, of course, Tony Abbott, the Leader of the Opposition, has made it perfectly clear he has no intention of acting on the Gonski reforms and has no intention of supporting extra Time money for has schools expired. and wants to cut Time's two expired, point Senator Kim Carr. Time's expired. Se Senator Bishop. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Broadband, Communications and the Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Can the minister advise the Senate how the national broadband network will grow the economy and enhance productivity? In particular, how will it support innovation and improve access to education for all Australians? The order, the Minister for Broadband, Communication and Digital Economy, Senator Conroy. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Could I thank uh, Senator Bishop for his question and his ongoing interest in education and the digital economy? Earlier this month, Mr. President, the government announced funding for 12 education and skills projects for primary education. schools, high schools, TAFEs and universities around Australia worth $27 million. These pilot projects Mr. President, will use the NBN to demonstrate how access to education can be improved using high-speed broadband particularly in regional areas. As a result, Mr President, high school kids in regional towns like Wollonga and Smithton will get access to the latest remote laboratory and research instruments from Monash University and the University of New South Wales. And I challenge those in that corner down there, in what used to be known as Cockey's Corner, but you'd have to abbreviate that nowadays, because their defence their defence of regional Australia is absolutely shameful. Absolutely shameful. Because, Mr. President, when opportunities like these are available for children in regional schools, you may well sit there silently because you should be ashamed of yourself. To be ruled over by the Liberals like this will see the children of regional Australians and rural Australians missing out missing out on the best possible education in this country. And Mr President, using the NBN from the home or classroom, students will have access to classes in science and engineering that would otherwise simply not be available. Asian languages and cultural studies will be taught to students in country schools who will be able to collaborate on projects with overseas Time, students order. face Time to face. Time has expired. Time has ex order on both sides. Order, order on both sides. I'm waiting. Order, order. Order. Senator Bishop. I thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary question to the minister. Can the minister advise the Senate of further measures the Gillard government is taking to, to develop schools so that Australians can maximise the benefits of the NBN? The, the minister. Mr. President. Uh -huh, they Order. Were awake. They were Order. Awake about time. Senator Conroy, ignore the interjections. Senator Conroy, continue. I wish they could shout us loudly in their own party room when it comes to arguing with the Liberals on this, Mr President, because they are the cowards of the bush at the moment. Mr President, the digital economy— oh, you've got a lot to order. say now, Senator Boyce, Conroy. But nothing to say Senator in the party Conroy, room. order. Senator Joyce, you will cease interjecting. Senator Conroy, ignore the interjections and address your comments to the chair. Apologies, Mr. President. Mr. President, the digital economy and the broader economy are increasingly one and the same. To help develop the skills required in a superfast broadband-enabled economy, the Gillard government 
is rolling out training programs to 40 of the first communities to receive access to the NBN. The NBN digital hubs and enterprises are today delivering valuable skills training to residents and small businesses in eight communities in Australia. They've conducted over 1,300 group and one-on-one -on -one training sessions, Mr President, 1,300. Last month, I announced the latest recipients of $15 million Time's in Commonwealth— expired. Time's expired. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Um, supplementary question to the minister, supplementary number two. Can the minister advise of any measures the Gillard government is taking to further grow the economy, enhance productivity and support innovation using the National Broadcast Network? Can you please advise of that, Minister Conroy? Order. Or order. 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 Senator Conroy. Mr President, the National Broadband Network will revolutionise the way government services are delivered. High-speed broadband allows more convenient access to government services, while actually lowering the cost of delivery to taxpayer. We are supporting Mr President, 40 local governments around the country to develop innovative service delivery models using the NBN. Mr President, for example, Circular Head Council in Tasmania and Onkaparinga Council in South Australia will enable residents to engage with council officers on development applications using high-definition video conferencing from the home or office. Mr President, these are the kind of innovations that are only made possible if Australians have access to reliable, affordable, high-speed broadband. We are on, the si on this side of the chamber, Mr President. Understand this. That is why we are taking Time action. has expired, Senator Conroy. Senator Evans. Uh, Mr President, can I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper? Got to start. Yeah. Se Senator Evans. Uh, Mr President, can I uh, seek to table and seek leave to incorporate uh, an answer to a question uh, that uh, Senator Milne put to me in my uh, responsibility representing the Minister of Resources and Energy on the 14th of August. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave granted. <laughs> Senator Conroy, you're not seeking the call, no? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Fifield. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers given by Senator Wong uh, to questions asked by Senators Cormann, uh, Senator Ennis and Williams. Uh, Mr Deputy President, there was uh, something which was apparent uh, in Senator Wong's uh, answers to uh, questions today, and that is she's finding our questioning on the carbon tax uh, a little bit tedious uh, and uh, a little bit wearing. Um, and I've got to be honest, uh, we're actually finding asking those questions a little bit tedious and a little bit wearing uh, because we continue to get no answers from the minister. But it's also a little tedious because the facts remain unchanged uh, that this carbon tax is a massive hit on the Australian economy uh, and that this carbon tax represents a breach of faith with the Australian people and represents a lie. Uh, so she had better get used to uh, getting these questions because we will continue to ask them no matter how tedious, no matter how repetitive, uh, because answers to these questions deserve to be on the public record. And we want to continue to make the point, as Senator Cormann did in his question, uh, that in the first three years of this carbon tax uh, it is going to rake in $18 billion of revenue. We want to continue uh, to make the point uh, that uh, Australia's 23 million people are going to be paying on average $115 per week uh, in comparison to the 502 million people in the EU uh, who will only pay uh, 23. Um, million dollars uh, per week. Sorry, that was 115 million per week before, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, the carbon tax uh, burden is five times higher uh, in Australia than that in the 30 nations of the EUETS, uh, a grouping whose GDP is 
14 times that of Australia. Uh, this is comparatively a massive burden uh, compared to what Europe uh, is being uh, confronted with. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, we also uh, had uh, a question from Senator Sinodinas uh, to uh, Senator Wong, uh, pointing out that uh, in a survey, 66 uh, per cent of small businesses indicated that they were absorbing uh, the cost of the carbon tax rather than passing it on uh, to uh, their customers. Uh, small businesses in an invidious position. Uh, do they take it on and absorb it, reduce their profitability, reduce their own viability, or do they pass those carbon tax on to their uh, customers, uh, again, potentially uh, driving customers away, uh, pricing themselves out of the market that they operate in, and again, uh, potentially affecting the profitability and viability of their business. It's a very invidious position to be in. And I just want to give you a bit of an indication, Mr Deputy President, of the attitude of the Australian Labor Party to business. I was at a gathering um, of the South East Melbourne Manufacturers Association in Dandenong uh, last year, and the guest speaker was uh, Mr Mark Dreyfus QC on the subject of why the carbon tax is good for your business. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Deputy President, I've got, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, the people there, the manufacturers there in Melbourne South East were wanting to strip flesh from the body of Mr. Dreyfus, but they were very restrained and they were very polite in the question and answer session. And uh, one manufacturer stood up and said, Mr. Dreyfus, uh, my business, we're, we're a manufacturer, my power bill is going to go up by $100,000 a year. And Mark Dreyfus's response was, well, that just proves my point that the effect of the carbon tax is modest. Uh, Mr Dreyfus was asked another question by a, a manufacturer of medical devices who said, look, our main product, uh, it costs $1,500 to produce um, and we only have a margin of about $15 on that, $15. And the carbon tax is going to completely wipe out our profit on this product. And Mark Dreyfus's response was, well, I think what that tells me is that your business has other problems, doesn't it? That was the response of Mark Dreyfus QC, man of the people, in touch with local business, in touch with his constituents. No idea. And this Mr Dreyfus, I, I think he probably takes um, some lessons from um, the Senator Wong School of Empathy with the Australian business community. Um, Mr Deputy President, you only need to talk to Australian businesses, be they small or medium, uh, to find out that in the real world, in the real economy, where people actually employ individuals uh, and try and make money to provide for their families, uh, that this carbon tax will have a devastating effect. And we await, with bated breath, answers to the questions we pose from Senator Wong. Thank you, Senator Fifield. Senator Crossan. Thanks, uh, uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise in uh, response to uh, uh, the taking uh, note this afternoon. I have to say I'm a little bit disappointed, Senator Firefield, you're not taking note of the answer to, uh, to Senator Mason's questions, but perhaps we'll get on to a debate about education at some other stage, because, of course, we do it much, uh, much uh, uh, better in, uh, in this side of the chamber. And I'm happy to talk about uh, the impact of uh, carbon price, and particularly on small business. Uh, and uh, you know, Senator Wong's contribution to this chamber day after day is, uh, is diligent and in thorough. And, and what she does tire of, of course, is people on the opposition side uh, continually asking her questions where the facts in their questions are inaccurate, or they ask, or they ask, as Senator as Senator Sinodonis did today, they ask. They ask actually for the modelling on small business to be tabled, and Senator Wong's response is, "It's already been made public." So again, we get uh, an opposition who is unprepared, uh, haven't done their research, aren't really aware of what they're particularly asking. If they'd done just a little bit of work and a little bit of diligence, they would have, in fact found that that modelling was a public document and perhaps wouldn't have embarrassed themselves so badly by actually asking for it. And Senator Firefield stands up and gives us some examples of when he met businesses in uh, the Dandenong region more than 12 months ago. Well, it would be interesting, I guess, Senator Firefield, to go back and talk to those businesses 
uh, now that the carbon legislation is through and now that these businesses are in fact um, dealing with that legislation. Order, so perhaps Senator the. Uh, Senator Cross, an order. Point of order, Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr. Well, Deputy President, well, then, well, then I, I am just outrageously grabbing the order, microphone to order. say that Senator I have Field, revisited have no, businesses and no they're still unhappy. Order. You have no point of order, Senator Fifield. Senator Cross, and you have well, the floor. Well, uh, you know, I think uh, I think that just reiterates and for me reconfirms uh, what I've been saying for the last two minutes that the opposition are extremely irrelevant, order. are extremely irrelevant, are totally unprepared. Uh, provide no research in this debate, provide no knowledge in this debate, but they do actually provide, order, they do actually provide order, an alternative policy. Order. They do provide an alternative policy, and I wonder, Senator Fifield, if you had enough stamina to stand up at the forum that you were in last year and actually explain to those small businesses that, in fact, your position, order. your policies position, even last year was that you want the same outcome that we want in terms of climate change. You have the same target, the same period of time, 5 per cent by 2020. But did you actually tell those small businesses that they would be paying a cost even more so than they are now? That the consumers that walk through the door and buy their product will be whacked with $1,300 a year in their household budget? That, in fact, at the end of the day, what you don't tell the Australian people what you don't front up to, what you are not honest about, is that not only do you want the same target in the same yearly outcome that we do, but you are going to do it so vastly different that you will actually take from families and give that money to the big polluters in this country. And you are entirely disingenuous when you talk about repealing this legislation. You are entirely disingenuous when you talk about the impact this is going to have on families and households. Perhaps Mr Windsor in the other chamber was absolutely honest and correct last week when he admitted that, in fact, uh, members of your party, Senator Firefield, came crawling Order. to him begging to actually form a government saying they would do anything, anything whatsoever. But, of course, at the end of the day, well, you see, at the end of the day, uh, Mr Windsor didn't actually believe you would be honest enough, didn't put any trust in you and didn't want to actually ensure that this country was going to be governed by this government uh, this country was going to be governed by a government that he could trust and he could work with so a condition a condition of his forming government was that he wanted to see climate change tackled through a price on carbon and then moving to of course a trading emissions scheme what you are on the other side of course is unprepared unresearched and uninformed about what is in this debate. And your lines will continue despite the fact that there are facts out there, despite the fact that people are now living with this on a day-to-day -day basis. Families are being compensated for their needs in terms of what is happening with the, uh, with the carbon pricing regime. Uh, and of course, what you also rely on is the front page of the newspapers to write your questions each day in question time. Thank you, Senator so Crossan. you rely Your time on. Has expired. Thank you, Senator Kroger. Thanks, Mr. Deputy President. And you've got to chuckle listening to that submission from Senator Grossman. You've got to chuckle, and you can see why she wanted us to take note of answers uh, in relation to education when she would not know one end of a business to another, having been a former union official for the National Tertiary Education Union in Northern Territory. I, it does beg the question, has she ever worked a day in her life in a business, whether it is a small business, whether it is a medium enterprise, has she ever, ever worked a day in a business to actually ascertain what it's about? And I have to say, for her to suggest, for her to suggest that Senator Firefield and the coalition are disingenuous in their, in their protestation over the introduction of a carbon tax and our pledge, which is a pledge which we will live to, our pledge that we will repeal the carbon tax is just laughable because the Australian public they know that we're dead set and we mean this. It is not something that we support in any context whatsoever. 
and if and should we be elected into government, the first thing, as our leader, the Honourable Tony Abbott, in the other place, has said, we will repeal this carbon tax, and so we will. But the other point that Senator Crossan actually was foolish enough to suggest was that we were not engaged with the business community. Twelve months ago, Senator Pfeiffer went to an event. He actually is engaged in Isaacs and many other electorates, as am I. And I would like to draw Senator Crossan's attention to a number of the things that the local businesses in the electorates that I am duty senator for, a number of electorates, and what they say about the carbon tax. Because it, if there is anything that the coalition is, and that is we are connected with the business community, we understand and know their challenges, because many of us, many of us have not only worked in businesses, but have actually run them and managed them and know the challenges that are faced every day by them. So I refer to a cabinet maker, a cabinet maker in Croydon, in Deakin, who has worked in the industry for 18 years. I was there with the Deakin candidate, Michael Suka only two weeks ago. This is what we do. We actually go and meet business people when parliament is not sitting to talk to them about the things that are making life difficult. And what he told us was that he can no longer employ apprentices, having been in the industry for over 18 years because of the escalating costs of doing an honest, uh, an honest day's work. He can no longer employ apprentices, and it is becoming increasingly harder. At a greengrocer that I, that I visited in Ringwood East, they are bracing themselves actually bracing themselves for their next electricity bill because their highest overhead, their most expensive overhead in running that business are electricity costs. So they are in fear of what that electricity bill will look like. And the reason is because to, in order to be able to make that business viable, they can no longer employ anyone. There is an incredibly fine line between not making any money and actually making a loss in a small business to actually having it, the books in the black. So where they once employed casual staff, they are reducing the number of staff that they can employ and actually covering the hours themselves. I mean, this is what small business do. They actually set up enterprises not only to try and support their families immediately, but to actually set up establishment and enterprises for their kids for times to come. But there are, there are a litany of small businesses. Mr. Mr Deputy President, in the last fortnight when we weren't sitting, there would have been 12 businesses that I went out and visited with John Newen, the candidate in Chisholm, and Michael Sukar in Deakin. And the message that we're told time and time again is that they will not be able to withstand the, the cost, the imposition of the carbon tax. But there are so many, so many examples that I could reiterate. Senator Sinodinus raised some again today that are in New South Wales, a butcher at the Oakley Market, same problem with the increasing costs of refrigeration or refrigerants rather. This is an imposition we will repeal. Thank you, Senator Kroger. Your time has expired. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, today we had a little cameo performance from Senator Fifield that really is just a proof positive demonstration of the intellectual waste intellectual wasteland, the intellectual desert that the opposition chooses to inhabit on the position of the carbon tax. Senator Feifel propped up and said two things, two sentences he, he enunciated. Firstly, he said, I want to take a point of order. Then he said, there is no point of order. And doesn't that exactly reflect the, the attitude of the opposition through this whole debate on the issue of carbon pricing and the introduction of carbon price post uh, June of this year, Mr Deputy President. Today's questions, today's questions from a range of opposition senators to Senator Wong had a set seriatim of big lies that the opposition chooses to put out on the issue and they choose to put out and peddle post the passage of the carbon pricing legislation in late June of this year. So what were the lies that they managed to put out there today? They were four in particular. 
Firstly, that Australia is introducing the biggest carbon tax in the world. Secondly, it won't achieve anything in carbon price uh, with, with the cut to Australia, won't achieve anything in terms of a cut of emissions. Thirdly, it won't achieve anything anyway because we are only a fraction of global emissions in the world. And finally, of course, the continuing generalised set of misrepresentations that occur as to price, and if I, which I have time to come to, I'll just highlight the error in Senator Kroger's contribution, Mr. Deputy President. But firstly, the first myth that was peddled by a range of speakers: Australia is introducing the biggest carbon tax in the world. Well, let me just say, not true, incorrect, factually unsound. People who make this claim, as Senator Cormann's leading the debate miss two things. Firstly, a whole range of countries already have carbon prices similar, but in most cases higher to that of Australia. And Senator Wong, Senator Wong took the trouble to go through half a dozen or eight of them in her response to Senator Cormann. And I just happen to have the list here. And I'll put it again on the record, Mr Deputy President. Norway's carbon tax on petrol is $61. Switzerland's, Switzerland's carbon tax on certain fuels is 36 Swiss francs, the equivalent of Australian $36. Sweden has a fuel tax of $138. Ah, but Ireland has a carbon tax of 20 euros, equating to $24. Finland's $36 to $72. In Canada, up to $29. And the UK has introduced a floor price for electricity sector. But secondly, and the more critical point made by Senator Wong in response, of course, is that while Australia's carbon price starts at $23 a tonne, the government is giving extensive assistance to industries that compete in international markets. Industries like steel, aluminium, oil refining, paper making, flat glass manufacturing and cement, nearly all of which I just note in passing are based on the East Coast in New South Wales and Victoria. And they'll effectively get up to 94.5 per cent. Think about that. 94.5 per cent of their carbon permits from the government for free. So free carbon permits will be issued to a range of firms that work in those industries. What does that mean, the effective price that those firms will, will pay for carbon tax and presumably to some degree passed on to their consumers, to their clients, to their customers? They'll be paying not $23 a tonne not $15 a tonne, not $10 a tonne. They will be paying effectively $1.30 a tonne. So that's the, uh, that's the price impact on the major emitters in the major industries that I outlined on the East Coast in Australia, $1.30 a tonne. And for that, we have had this huge debate over the last two or three years. The last two or three Order. years. Now I still only got half a minute, half a minute left. left to make this contribution. So I'll straight to Senator Kroger's point that electricity costs in a retail grocer in Ringwood, I think, in Victoria, is the highest cost in that retail grocer's business, conveniently, affecting, conveniently forgetting the cost of stock, the, st the cost of product, the cost of labour, the cost of lease. And every time a small business organisation comes to speak to you, what do they want to talk about? We need labour market deregulation. Costs are high. We need you to attack the property trusts that own the shopping centres. We need you to address the cost of stock that we have to purchase. They don't mention carbon tax because it's about 2 per cent or less of their costs. But Senator Kroger thought it was Thank the highest Senator cost. Thank you, Senator Bishop. Your time has expired. Senator Senadinas. Thank you, Mr uh, Deputy President. Um, lies, lies and damn statistics. I mean, honestly, what we have just heard from uh, Senator Bishop uh, itself constitutes lies because he's flying in the face of the evidence, the field evidence that has been provided even this very day by the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry with its report on trading conditions in small business, where they talk about the trading conditions are below the average of the last five years, which of also includes the period of the global financial crisis. The survey goes on to talk about the decline in various economic indicators of the health of small business. The survey talks about how taxes and charges, Senator Bishop, through you, Mr Deputy President, are the number one issue for small business, taxes and charges. Now, you may be cynical and say people don't like taxes, but the fact of the matter is, is you're not shooting the opposition, 
You're shooting the messenger in small business. That shows what you think of small business. Instead of being out there giving succour to small business, instead of being out there saying, how can we help you to get through this, you are blithely saying, well, you know, they're not actually subject to the carbon tax and in any case they can always pass this on. The fact is that there's this survey, this field evidence, these are facts, not lies, shows Small business in Australia today are doing it tough, and that means they do not have a capacity to pass on big price rises. And we talk about the price impact of the carbon price, the impact of uh, gas refrigerant and other things that are going up quite markedly. The fact of the matter is this is all coming at a time when other costs are going up for small business. They've got the superannuation guarantee starting to go up. They've got electricity prices also going up for other reasons, as has been mentioned before. So the fact of the matter is Small business are doing it tough at the moment. They see the carbon tax, something which is a discrete government decision, and they say to themselves, well, why is government making it any worse for us than it already is? And government says, well, you can just pass it on. But as Senator Kroger so eloquently indicated, if you don't understand small business, you don't under understand the competitive environment that small business faces. Yes. It is not easy to pass costs on. Your choice are these. You can lower your profits, lower your employment, lower your investment. Lower profits will ultimately lead to either lower employment or lower investment. In small business, the engine room of the economy, and this is the dilemma we face. I want to take up this issue about what the modelling said or didn't say about the impact of the carbon price on electricity costs uh, and other costs facing small business. Uh, contrary to what Senator Wong said, there was no discrete modelling of the impact on small business, and I wish Senator Crossan was still here to hear that. There, was, uh, there were estimates made through the modelling about the macroeconomic impact of the carbon tax in terms of its impact on the CPI and the rest. There was modelling done on discrete sectors, but by firm size that modelling was not done, contrary to what Senator Wong said. And that was the point of my question, because we, we have to consider that small business are being hit by bigger businesses which are directly subject to the carbon price, and they are passing their cost increases back through the supply chain to their suppliers, to other people that, that uh, are customers of theirs. And so that means that small businesses cop it in the neck because big businesses are asking them to take up the slack when it comes to the impact of the carbon tax. And of course, because small businesses are unable to do that, or they're forced to do that in order to retain the custom of big businesses, you have this situation where small business is being squeezed. Now, I've been surprised in the time I've been here about the extent to which the, the, the government does not talk about small business in a positive way. It's only in a defensive way. Well, you know, we may have imposed X on them over here, but we're giving them this or that particular concession. As I noted earlier, these concessions are occurring at a time when a broad range of costs are going up for small business. So the challenge that lies ahead for any future government is how to take the burden off small business in a sustainable way. The coalition has indicated that will be done by first and foremost taking the carbon tax off the backs of business, including small business, but we need to go further. As my colleague uh, uh, in another place noted today, there are more than 18,000 regulations which have come in since this government has been in and less than uh, 90 or so that have been repealed. We have a, a deal of work to do in that whole regulatory space because small business does not have the overheads to deal with the burden of regulation. And that regulation is both at the Commonwealth, state and local level. And it's a real issue. It's not just the merits of an individual regulation, it's the fact that each individual regulation comes on top of so much new regulation. And the coalition is committed to finding a way through that. But as I reiterate today, small business is being affected by the carbon tax. The government should not have their head in the sand. Thank you, Senator, Senator Danis. Your time has expired. The quest Senator Mill on the same matter. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Fife will be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Milne, you wish to move a motion and take note of answers? Uh, thank you, Mr answer. Deputy President. Um, yes, I uh, move to take note of an answer by uh, Minister Carr in relation to a question pertaining to the uh, Gonski review of school funding. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I was really alarmed today when uh, the Prime Minister delayed uh, the government's response to the Gonski review. Uh, the government has had this review for six months. There was a broad expectation in the whole education community across Australia that the government's response to the Gonski review would be out this week, 
and yet we had an unexplained delay, Mr. Deputy President, and not only an unexplained delay, but we had the Prime Minister taking another significant shift, whereas before the government had said that no school would lose a dollar as a result of the Gonski review, the shift today was every school will receive an increase in government funding. That is quite a different claim from saying no school will lose a dollar under the government's uh, funding model. Now, the issue here is there has been an inequitable funding model for schools for the last uh, decades, and that is because under the Howard government the most uh, inequitable system was brought in, whereby a formula was to be applied according to socio-economic status, but it was distorted immediately by saying that those schools who were receiving more money than they were entitled to under a socio-economic formula would now be entitled uh, to keep the additional money, so that inequity has gone on to the point where we now have so many, particularly public schools around Australia, because the majority of students are still educated in public schools, and they are the schools where the children with the greatest disadvantage uh, tend to be going to school. And so the Gonski Review came out with a model that aimed to address that disadvantage by allocating a standard amount per student with loadings for students with a disability and those from low-income Indigenous and non-English speaking backgrounds. And the view was that the Commonwealth would put in, uh, would put in at least uh, five billion, it would cost all up, and the Commonwealth would put in three. I was really alarmed when I heard the Prime Minister say today, I have never looked at a big independent school in an established suburb and thought this is not, far, not fair. And I would put to her, has she ever looked at a big public school in an established suburb and thought this is not fair? Because she should have thought that as she walked around the country and travelled around the country. Because I'll tell you what, two schools, two enrolments, some in very um, highly uh, established and wealthy suburbs, other large public schools in lower socio-economic suburbs, and I can tell you, compare the two, and it is not fair. So the issue here is we need an, an unequivocal guarantee that this legislation will come before the parliament and have enough time to get through before Christmas. We cannot, we cannot sustain any more delays. We need to fix this inequitable funding model once and for all, and then we need that certainty because schools need to plan for it for 2014. There cannot be any more delays. There's been delay, delay, delay since the 2007 election. It cannot go on. We want that legislation in here before Christmas. Secondly, we want to know from the government, and the minister evaded the question again today, where is the Commonwealth getting the money from to be able to finance the Gonski implementation? We must find that money. The Greens are prepared to put our shoulder to the wheel and work with the government to raise that money, to find ways of the finding those billions that are necessary. And the one option that I put to the minister today, we've already put the mining super profits tax and the government didn't want to do that. We've put on the table getting rid of fossil fuel subsidies—$7.2 billion a year we waste on fossil fuel subsidies. We could get rid of those. Equally, the, the government currently spends $3.4 billion on a coal railway for the Hunter Valley, which is singularly for coal trucks. Nobody else uses that uh, proposed railway, and it's to facilitate the opening of a whole lot of new coal mines to make greenhouse gases more extensive than they are. So let's get on with it. We want the legislation before Christmas. We want it to be an equitable funding model that genuinely addresses the disadvantage of public education in Australia. And thirdly, we want a proposition from the government as to how it's going to be funded so that we do get it funded and there is not some excuse with it's tied to a whole range of other things. Whatever you want in performance standards in schools, they need to be funded. You can't lift performance across the whole range of things you need to provide to students without money. And we need that funding, and the Greens are prepared to deliver it, but I am worried about the delays. Thank you, Senator Milne. The question is the motion moved by Senator Milne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion?